Welcome to another episode of Code for Thought. As 2023 draws to a close, I would like to finish season 6, the English version that is, with a conversation I had with Sarah Petty and Yevgeny Karev from the Open Knowledge Foundation. I came across the Open Knowledge Foundation through a former colleague of mine who did some work for them. And for my part, I'm always interested in organizations and groups that are built on the principles of open source and open data. The Open Knowledge Foundation provides a number of tools and services around open source and open data, mainly for government agencies, public services and researchers. And one of those tools is called Frictionless Data. Sarah and Yevgeny explain in more detail what they try to accomplish with it. A lot of that has to do with the fact that the CSV format, that is the comma-separated value, remains a very popular format, not least because they can be created easily from spreadsheets such as Excel, which are also widespread in research and public services, by the way. The trouble with CSV files is that data errors can slip in easily, or that when you import or export CSV data from spreadsheets, some weird data type conversion happens that can bomb your data set, as Sarah and Yevgeny will tell us in our conversation. But before we go into that, I would like to thank you so much for listening to this podcast. As I said, this is the last English episode of Season 6. The next season will kick off in January 2024, and I hope you will tune in again then. In the meantime, whether you celebrate Christmas or not, I hope you will be able to take a break, put your feet up, relax and recharge your batteries, and perhaps even enjoy listening to some of the episodes of this podcast, like the following conversation with Sarah and Yevgeny. Hello everybody, I'm very excited to talk to the Open Knowledge Foundation today, and with me here are Sarah and Yevgeny, and I'm going to hand over to you, Sarah and Yevgeny, to introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So hello, everybody. Thanks, Peter, for having us today. I'm Sara Petti. I'm the Frictionless Data Community Manager. I have also other roles of the Open Knowledge Foundation, but today I will be speaking as the Frictionless Data Community Manager. Yeah, my name is Evgeny. I'm a tech lead of the Frictionless Data Project, and I work at Open Knowledge Foundation as well. Actually, Sarah and I, we almost met in Brussels at FOSDEM. Unfortunately, I didn't get to your talk about research tools. We have a common friend, Carles, who actually used to work with me. So there's a bit of a connection here. I know that we're talking about frictionless specifically today, but could you briefly introduce what Open Knowledge Foundation is? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe I can start and then I've got it. Please feel free to fill in if I'm forgetting something. Basically, Open Knowledge Foundation, it's a foundation based in the UK, but active globally. And we work to push forward the open knowledge. We have specifically worked with open data for a very long time. But I would say that we have been active in the whole sort of like open uh, movement in general, in the sense that we work a lot with open data, but we do that through developing open source tools. And we have been developing projects in different areas as well. For example, open government, open government data. Yeah. We had in the past GLAM projects as well, for example. So um, I would say we've been very active in the space. And I think one of the projects actually is CCAN, isn't it? Which is just now being marked today. Today being the, the 19th of June, 2023. But I saw a blog post that it's being marked as a public good. Have you been involved in CCAN? Uh, not me, Evgeny has, so maybe he can tell you a bit more about it. So regarding the technical part, as an organization in general, we work a lot of different things. We have a data index, so we have, a, have a open definitions and other projects between technology and politics. But regarding software, we are mostly focusing on the data portals. And mm-hmm. of course, CCAN was our first big project back in the day we created at Open Knowledge Foundation. And Currently, it's, as it says, it's a kind of like leading data management system used by a lot of uh, different governments and more organizations. But we currently we partially maintain uh, the second already is uh, established uh, governance and uh, mm-hmm. open knowledge is just a part of this governance. Just a little bit more about Open Knowledge Foundation because people may not be familiar with it. How large is the organization actually? I mean, the organization itself, so the foundation, varies in time. I think around we're around 15 in the core team at the moment, but we have a global mm. network uh, that I lead. So when I'm not a frictionless data community manager, I'm actually leading the international network lead. 
And we are present in 40 countries around the globe. Of course, like our network members varies in size. So we have very, very big, for example, chapters in Germany. For example, we have 40 people. We have a big chapter in Brazil as well with like 15 people working for them. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's just grassroots organizations that sort of like gather a community that is interested in working with data and more generally open knowledge on the ground. We even have a chapter in Somalia, for example, with two or three people working at the university there, Nepal, South America and in Europe. So it's great to see actually some activity also in the global south because that usually gets a little bit neglected. <laughs> yeah, and actually half. the global south yeah, becoming currently our really important thing for us it's uh, maybe our next uh, real effort to mm. empower things uh, in global south our ceo Renata is really currently working on the global south development in open knowledge maybe something else that i wanted to add on um, the global south subject that you brought up is maybe worth to mention that now the core team at open knowledge foundation is mainly from the global south thanks very much for this introduction about open knowledge foundation and now we can move on to frictionless And again, I'd like to ask you to explain what frictionless is. I think the story behind frictionless, it's also related to CCAN. When CCAN started to get like bigger, used by more organizations, the creator of CCAN, Rufus Pollock, I think, thought that CCAN is great, but we need some open standards for data sharing. And CCAN didn't have public, openly available, like, data types, schemes. Uh, they, they've been working on it, but it wasn't, like, an open standard. So the next step was, I think, like, really natural to create open data standards so the data is easily shareable and, for example, uh, scientific research can be reproducible. That was, yeah, the beginning of the project, the, the idea of interchangeable data format, metadata for data. Sarah, what is your role in Frictionless? So what I do is basically I manage the community around Frictionless Data. Frictionless Data is an open source project. So for this reason, the community around it is very, very important to us. The community is what gives us like feedback on the work that we do, guides parts of the project. And maybe I can, I can go into details about this later. But mm. basically provides a context that makes sure that we have many different use cases in mind when we do our development and also like brings up things that we didn't think about before. So let's focus on the community aspect first, maybe, because what does the community actually consist of? What kind of users or user groups are we talking about? I would maybe divide our community in different kind of segments. I would say that the macro areas that are more present in the community, we have a lot of people working in governments. We do have a big component of people working in academia, also because Basically, for a very long time, we we received the funding from the Sloan Foundation to basically make friction as a tool to make research reproducible. And we run also a fellowship with uh, young researchers at the time. So we have co- developed a community around that. And then we have, of course, more general data wranglers coming from consultancies, NGOs and startups uh, around the globe. In mm-hmm. terms of geography, I already mentioned this, but we have a good presence in Europe, North America and South America as well. We have a very big community in Brazil at the moment where the open knowledge chapter of Brazil is also running training programs based on frictionless. And mm-hmm. even the federal government is using actually frictionless data standards for their open data portals. And we are also present in Africa, as I mentioned. We do have community members in Asia as well. Maybe we're a bit less present there, I would say. Despite the fact that uh, at the moment, actually, two of the co-members are from Nepal. So we have uh, Mm -hmm. one of the frictionless developers, Sassigarti, who's from Nepal. And we also recently welcomed in the core team, uh, Nikesh Palami, who is the CEO of Open Knowledge Nepal, but is actually developing some kind of like trading programs for us. Well, that's quite diverse. How do you manage a community like that, that spans across the globe? I mean, give us an insight in your daily work and how you herd the cats so to speak? Well, of course, I mean, it's, we tried many things. Sometimes we failed at many things, uh, I would Mm. say, and that's the way that things should work. Anyhow, I think it's always a sort of like Mm. try and and find that the best way. Uh, We have a community chat, which is very active for a very long time. We run a Discord server, which turned out not to be very good for our community. So we recently changed it for Slack community chat, where at the moment we have around 250, 300 people present there and quite active. Of course, because we want to allow also people that prefer to use an open protocol to be present there as well. We have a matrix bridge, so people are not forced to be into Slack to come to the community chat, but they can also pass through matrix. We have monthly community calls as well. 
uh, which are quite important for us because it's a way we generally have once a month a presentation from a project from the community. And then we have a sort of like discussion uh, with the community present mm -hmm. about the project itself that was presented, but also about general development of the project. All the project is on GitHub. So uh, we started mm -hmm. using GitHub project, which works quite well for us. And so we gather also community input through issues. May I ask why Discord didn't work? I think there were big concerns about the terms of use, which are not great uh, in Discord. A lot of our community is basically uh, very invested in open. Uh, and so being on basically a service that was not open was uh, maybe a problem for them. Okay. In terms of ourselves, we also wanted something that was a bit more searchable than Discord in order to make sure that we could keep track of all the questions. Yeah, so that was mainly the decision. And then Slack, it's still not an open protocol, but we thought it would be better because a lot of you people are using it. So it makes it just mm. easier for people to add. Let's move on to the more technical aspects and frictionless. So what kind of friction are you trying to remove? Where's the friction in data and data handling that frictionless is dealing with? Yeah, so, so I think it's 2023 20, and we have like a lot of super cool data systems for people who works professionally with data, especially in commercial sector, all these uh, data lakes, warehouses, new things like data bricks, snowflakes. But for public sector, it's still, you know, it's kind of like still people adding CSVs on some kind of open data portals like CCAN. And this data is still often not valid, not well described, not, not fully usable, because if it's just a file on a, mm -hmm. some governmental site, without description of the fields, without proper types, maybe with some errors. It's just not useful for the society. That's the main friction point we're trying to solve with our standards and for example, validation for a framework and platform. I believe, and I'm please correct me if I'm wrong, but the Dublin metadata set that try to standardize at least some types of data, where in the landscape does frictionless sit? Yes, there are a lot of different standards and mostly they focused on uh, linked data and getting like connections between different entities and data. And the frictionless standard, if you're talking about currently, uh, the standards, data package, our uh, main standard, tries to solve more low level problem, just describing a data set in its nutshell, what's files, what's columns, what types. And the idea that it's uh, radically simpler than for example, uh, DCAT or other systems. And it's not tied to any semantics like Dublin Core. You can describe different ontologies, right? But mm. the package is just totally orthogonal for any data. It's uh, just backbone for describing data. So, for example, a data package, you can add just DBT to columns property from like Dublin Core adding to data. Uh, Dublin Core can be integrated in the backbone being a data package. Oh, right. Okay. So it's kind of a meta level, so to speak. So you have some kind of data that could be files. It could be text files. It could be audio yes, files. Yes. It could be video files. It could be anything, basically. Yeah, yes. Surprisingly, if you don't have any metadata, you don't know what this file, right? So Frictions try, tries to solve this like really low level problem. And mm -hmm. for higher levels, it can be, Dublin Core can be used to describe ontologies. Could you give us a run through where we are with frictionless at the moment? At the moment, basically what we have is, of course, the standards of frictionless, but then we rapidly discovered that for people to use those standards, it was very useful to have like software that would allow people to use them. So we have pretty well developed Python framework at the moment. And recently we beta launched uh, the frictionless application that Evgeny can explain better than me. Okay, so we have basically the standard, but then it also comes with a tool set that you actually can apply. Okay, Yevgeny, over to you. Yes, yeah, so the standards was like initial thing for the first maybe five years. We tried to just have these standards and small libraries in different languages. It was a part of our Swan grant. But then I think we kind of like realized that to get mass adoption, like real mass adoption, we need to use, we try different approaches because mm -hmm. it's good if there is a like standard, some libraries, but it's uh, one more standard, right? Because why people would use it. We started working on uh, more 
user-friendly projects like Frictions Framework in Python, which has a simple interface. But then we realized that it's still not enough. <laughs> so now we're working on the UI. We want to you know, bring this idea of data description, data validity mm. for non-coding people. So it's kind of like zero code application. Okay, Sarah. Yes, I just wanted to add that the way that we work at the moment together with our community is also that we, the core team inside the Open Knowledge Foundation leads the work when it comes to the standards and the Python framework. But then we have what we call the Frictionless Universe, which is led by the community. And the Frictionless Universe is basically uh, libraries in many other programming languages. We have R, PHP, Julia, and although they get input from us, that part of the project is completely led by the community. And we have a good examples, for example, from when we talk about the R library, which is led by a team of data scientists at the, and engineers from the Open Science Laboratory for Biodiversity in Belgium. And we have a ton of examples like this. You mentioned governments being clients, for lack of better phrase. But you mentioned that part of the community or an essential part of the community also being research labs and academics. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Part of that is due to the fact that we run this frictionless data for reproducible research program, which was funded, as I said, by Sloan. Mm -hmm. And during that time, we had so three cohorts of fellows. So that was young researchers from around the globe, really diverse team who were trained to make their research data open and fair. Training on like general fairness of the data and then like how we can reach that using the frictionless tools. And then something else that we did during the Sloan funding time. Yes, actually there were three cohorts, as Evgeny just reminded me, running throughout the years. And the last one, I think, ended in July last year. But then we also had what we call pilots that were run, for example, with Dryad, which is an open access repository of research data in the US. And same happened also with Bicodemo. And that's quite interesting because basically this repository, we did a pilot project with them to integrate in the management system, a kind of validation based on the frictionless standards and on the frictionless data workflow. What does this mean? It means that basically when the data is input in the manage management system, frictionless runs a kind of validation on it so we can early on catch errors on the data. And so the person who's uploading the data gets visual message about it and they can quickly go and correct the data. And what is also very important to make sure that data is really fair is that what frictionless will do is also that they will record the cleaning steps. So once mm. basically the data set is taken by someone else, they can quickly see what happened and what kind of changes were made on the raw data based on the frictionless validation. And when we talk about FAIR, we mean the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable and reproducible, I think. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay. How do you start with a standard? That's quite an undertaking, isn't it? So you want to harmonize the way people use and describe data. And how did it all start? Well, I think Evgeny talked a bit about this. So I think it started with some ideas inside the foundation mm. at the same time as Seekan was developed to really have some sort of like very lightweight standards that were really domain agnostic. And so mm. therefore they could be used and, and made domain specific by other people. The idea really was to have these Lego blocks that you could combine. One thing to add to the equation that uh, we're talking about the 10 years ago, and for example, CSV on the web, it's also another standard, really similar to data, data package, but only for CSV. It was developed in 2017. Yeah, it was at the time when all this data publishing boom was happening, and uh, people just realized that do we have any way to describe CSV. So it's just a right. really simple question, but it seems to be there uh, was no way 10 years ago. So this coming with this idea of data package, I think was a really natural thing as well as uh, CSV on the web and other standards. A standard becomes really a standard when it's used by a lot of people. What I'd like to get to is how do you actually convince people to use that standard? Yeah, of course, it's one of the main aspects because there is a situation that, for example, CSV on the web is really used and promoted by the British agencies and data package is used, as Sarah said, like in Brazil. But yeah, that's the problem we we we'll be working now and be coming to the publishing second version of our standards. And the part of this work will include new ways of disseminating the standard. For example, 
what we think is more native integration with uh, big data systems like CCAN, Zenodo, mm -hmm. and uh, like Dryad. So basically, a data package is a kind of like simple data API. You have a data set on Zenodo, for example, if it's uh, available as a data package API, you can just reuse it in some data analysis system. Mm -hmm. And from a community aspect, Sarah, I think there's also you've got your work cut out to actually convince people. So you have community calls, you have the various different channels, but how do you actually convince people to adopt a standard? Well, this is a very good question. And I think there are many aspects to it, but not a clear answer. I think that many of the things that we can take into account is, for example, when you have a standard that relies also on other standards, so make it, for example, more trustworthy in a way. For Frictionless, I think that a lot of community members were convinced by the fact that it's very lightweight and general in a way, so people can use it as it is, but they can also like make it domain-specific if they want. We have an example with the fiscal data package, for example, that was used in a big open knowledge project from a long time ago, which is open spending. I think there's also like iterative process that we're trying to have right now when we're thinking about the second iteration of the standards. There are some people, so for example, I cited before the maintainers of the R package, they used, for example, the data package while generally data package is used with tabular data a lot. They used it, for example, with camera trap data, with like photos and image data, and giving also the community the space to show what they're doing with the standards or with the software. It's also, I think, an important component. Okay, but that's interesting because I think that is something that community projects all have to struggle with, which is to actually get people on board. How do you bring the community together? I think that someone that is very present in the open source and open data space is also trying not to reinvent the wheel and make an effort when someone already has done that somewhere else. There's a culture of collaboration that is very much present, I would say. So instead of competing, maybe we can work together to do stuff. Of course, there are other standards out there. There are other software as well that, that can be considered as competitors in a way. I mean, we're out of a logic of like marketing and this kind of things. So we're out of a commercial logic. So it's okay. really about convincing people by using it, basically, and by making them part of the community, making them part of like mm. the decision that are taken, being transparent, being accountable on what is happening. I think there's a lot to do with that. Maybe an interesting thing that I could cite from the sort of like adoption point of view is that we run together with the um, fellows program that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. we also in parallel run something else, which is called the Tool Fund. And actually, Carles, so our mutual friend, was part of that as well. Oh, I see. Okay. And the Tool Fund was basically giving very little scholarship, a token of money, so let's say, uh, for them to develop a tool on top of frictionless data in a way that would make frictionless data more, more useful for them. So, for example, Carles, who was working with a lot of his colleagues with Excel, developed a tool that basically allowed to use frictionless data on top of Excel. Which probably brings us now to the question of validation. So, Yevgeny, what do we actually mean by validating data? In our case, our main goal is low-level validation. First of all, it's a structural checks of data. It's way easier in other formats like market. You basically don't need this. But for Excel and CSV, often published by um, a lot of people, <laughs> it can be just structurally damaged. Like the simple thing, just not a regular count of cells in every row, other stuff. So we have a uh, theory error types that frictionless looks for. Part of them are structural. And the second, uh, second part is a uh, schema error. Here we talk about data types. Basically, there are two main standards, data package for a data set and table schema for a CSV, for example. Uh, you can add uh, data types, you can add constraints. It's really similar to SQL schema, but not living inside the SQL uh, server or something, just being applied to CSV and uh, open data. So you can add uh, constraints, you can add other uh, limitations to the data and checks. The tool will just show all these errors, what row, what column. An extra part that uh, our framework, of course, allows to add custom checks, so you can add custom checks based on your domain. How big are the metadata that we're talking about? How much effort is it to create that? Surprisingly, it's, it's, it's not big. So it's, uh, it's not a lot of effort, actually, to describe a data set, so just small JSON file. 
because you just say here's file one it's uh, like about birds and you add a description and then you add more technical details but yeah also it's, i think it's really important also to add that you can add licensing you can add contributors you can add data sources the important thing is that obviously when people are getting a csv file with a description of what's actually in there then Somebody else who can understand that schema can take that on board and import it into their system and know how to deal with that. So that's basically how the validation then works. So, but there are two parts. There's the table schema itself, and then there are data types. You mentioned data types, the data type definition. Uh, That's not separate. Did I get that wrong? It's one data package. More human related part is description of files, like this file for this, this file for that. And more technical part, yeah, data types. So this is like an integer, or this is a date time. You know these famous stories about Excel breaking genes research or something like this, when Excel mm-hmm. was out of formatting some cells, just breaking the whole semantics. We got a lot mm-hmm. of scientific research with a lot of invested money based on broken data because of Excel just changing the format of columns. Mm, exactly, yeah. That's a very infamous story from computational biology. And I think that still now there's an assessment that 30% of the data set that are published together with an article are actually corrupted data because of autocorrections from Excel. So which brings us to the use cases actually in science. So we talked about government and we talked about computational biology. Where else have scientists actually started to adopt frictionless? As I mentioned, we worked with data management systems like, for example, Dryad or Bicodemo, which is basically a biological and chemical oceanography data management office. So we did work with them a lot. Uh, We started to work a bit with the energy community as well. We had collaborations, for example, with research libraries and uh, data managers, just giving them training. Because the story that Evgeny was telling about this Excel breaking all these genes is a very simple story of why validation is important. And the fact that those data sets were never sort of like validated against the proper metadata prevented people from catching the error early on. And they had to do this thing that scientists really hate to do, which is retract papers. But then who else is in our community? I think we have people from health research from the US. We had a very interesting example at our last community call. Uh, Mm -hmm. which is the World Glacier Monitoring Service. And they are basically a research center which is maintaining a long-running data set to measure basically the changes of the mass of glaciers. And they do that combining satellite data, so machine-generated data, together with measurements that are taken by human. So they had this problem that human-generated data had to be validated. So uh, for them, the frictionless data workflows were very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So we're coming to the end now. What I would like to ask is uh, two questions, actually. The first one, the roadmap of frictionless. So where do you see it going? And then finally, how do people get involved and get in touch with you? But let's talk about the roadmap first. Basically, a main part of our roadmap is the visual interface when you can just open a file in your ID Mm -hmm. and everything is inferred. You can just add descriptions and whatever. So... Yeah, that's basically our roadmap to make the data description accessible for many. So finally, if people want to get involved, and we're talking about a community project here, how do they get in touch with you and where should they start? Maybe the first place to go to is the project website, which is frictionlessdata.io. So on there, you can have a look, understand what the project is like, see who the core team is and many, many other things. From there, maybe the second step, depending on the kind of things you're interested in, would be to maybe join uh, the community chat. So as I said, we're on Slack, but if you prefer an open protocol, you can also join via Matrix. And you will find all the invite links on the website as well. If you're interested in the more technical aspect of the project, all our libraries are open on GitHub. So you can also go there. You can have a look at the roadmap of the project, which is published there. And for those who would like to start to contribute, we also have good first issues to work on. And one thing that I would definitely recommend, also because I'm always there, is to come to the community calls so that Mm. we get to see each other, you get to meet other community members, and you also get to hear about very cool projects. And you have fellowships. Let's not forget that. I think there are also fellowships uh, or fellowship programs. Does that still continue? 
So we don't have any fellowship at the moment. We might look into it in the future. We're also thinking about like more general program at Open Knowledge Foundation just for data literacy. It's kind of a continuation of our School of Data project. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I wish you all the best in your endeavors and for the exciting work that you do. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thanks for having us. Oh, time's up. See you next time. But before I forget, this podcast is covered by the Creative Commons license. See ya.